So what we're going to do next is we're going to work on the texture of this um, of the air cleaner, and that texture is is the is the little bits of gravel and light spots in in the um, asphalt that's under here. Again, the whole idea is to build up all these things, these details, before I get to the the airbrush. I want to do as much as I can with the paintbrush, so that when I take over with the airbrush those two tools are blended together. If I rely heavy on either one or the other, you can see that. It won't go, it won't look like a painting anymore. It'll look like an airbrush painting or it'll look like a paintbrush painting. For me, the idea is that I don't want people to really co concentrate on the, the techniques or anything like that. I really want them to just kind of look at the image and that's really relying on the strengths of both tools. So the asphalt is already based in with that, with that color and what was nice was I used the same, I used the same color that I actually sprayed in the, the, the base with the, when, I, when, I, when I did the asphalt in the, in the painting. So what's nice is that's exactly the same, that's, that's matched up. On a painting, even like this, even though it's only five inches by seven inches, if I have a reoccurring color like the asphalt or the sky, um, I'll mix up a little bit of that beforehand, uh, just so I have it, so I don't have to keep remixing it. I mean, it's pretty rare that I'll pre-mix colors, but there, that, this asphalt color appears all over this painting, just as the blue does as well, the sky blue. So those two colors I did mix up separately. Unfortunately, I didn't bring them with me, so, <laughs> so I gotta kinda wing it for this, but that's okay. So for the light parts of the asphalt, these little speckles, um, they're, they're in there, um, but they're also kind of, they follow the, the pattern of, of the horn, or not the horn cover, sorry, the air cleaner. So there's a, as, as this part bends around here, this is really a, a curved part of like an indentation where the middle of the air cleaner kind of is. So all these little bits of asphalt or these reflections of asphalt follow those as well. And again, it may seem minor, but it's really the minor things that, that make this painting what it's gonna be, especially on this scale. You're dealing with such a small area, you have to really pay attention to just about everything, which is, is what makes it a lot of fun to paint, and it also gives it its final kind of wow factor in a way. If you pay attention to all the little tiny, tiny things, that's really what pulls it all together and makes it really what you want it to be. So what this color is, and I've moved the palette so it's a kind of out of the way, so you guys are just really in close now for the details. This is just the same as, as the, the ground color, which uh, is just the opaque white. Um, it's a little bit of yellow ochre and a tiny bit of opaque black, and that's how I got this color. What I did to make this lighter color is I just pushed the white a little bit more in the mix. So first thing, notice I did the, the little indentation on the, on the air cleaner here. And then this bottom section is uh, the, the little pieces of asphalt that are here are a little bit rounder. They're not as elongated as the pieces up here. So I just kind of block them in. Um, the airbrush stipples really well, which is how I did the, the asphalt in the actual background of the painting. But for this, because it's such a tight area and it's so controlled, um, it's easier to do this part with the paintbrush. Uh, you'll also notice how long the paint is staying wet in the brush. And again, that's, that's the beauty of these watercolor brushes. They just have a bigger belly so they can hold that wet paint and keep it kind of flowing longer. So I just kind of fill in all the gaps. Just kind of make sure I get the pattern in the right way. And then up here in this section right here, though, that asphalt kind of pops in again, but it's a lot less noticeable. So I just want to kind of sparsely put it in here. And again, that wet paint is still wet in that brush, which is really, really nice. Again, with a nylon bristled brush, uh, the paint kind of slides off it. So it tends to dry a little bit quicker on there. So plus I haven't found a, a a synthetic bristled brush that has the point of these sable brushes. These brushes just retain such a crazy killer point. It just, uh, it's hard for me not to use it. Uh, I originally, uh, originally started airbrushing with, with a watercolor type paint and when I transitioned to acrylic based paint like Createx, uh, I knew I'd still be using these brushes even if they weren't going to work the right way. Um, I was going to figure out how to get them to work the right way. 
and um, and that's just because of the performance of them. They're 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 outrageous. So they really work well. All right. So I'm just kind of throwing in the rest of this detail. I'm going to get as much out of this brush as I can before the paint kind of dries up. And what's nice is as the paint is drying, it slows the paint coming off the paintbrush. So these dots that I'm putting in now are actually a lot drier than the first round. So I can go back over the places I already kind of put paint in, and it has a different texture than when I started painting, which is really nice. And now that I'm getting towards the end, that paint is totally dry, or almost totally dry on the brush. So now what I'm doing is I'm getting a real dry brush type of technique. It's putting down like a really, a really small kind of fractured brush pattern as this, this paint dries all on the, the brush. All right, so that is good. So that's the texture of the uh, asphalt. Again, what's gonna happen is as we get going, I'll inter reintroduce the airbrush into this and that'll blend everything together and you'll see that happen. So if there's a place that doesn't quite you know, match up, you'll see how that airbrush really blends everything in. Uh, it's like on the foot pad, this, this darker area into this lighter area, that's really a, a, a soft blend. Uh, and that'll happen with the airbrush. I really just blocked it in with this. All right, so let's get some of these other details in. And then um, I think we'll switch out to the airbrush. There's a lot of stuff going, along, going on on the outside edge of this air cleaner. This whole thing, except for the really front, the molded section, is all chrome. So all the details that are going on um, on the edge of this thing are really cool too. So we'll get some of those in as well. So next up is um, like is a darker color. So I'll go with this. I'm still going to kind of stick with the blue theme. So I'm going to mix up again. It's the same colors that we just had in the in the you know, on the palette. It's the phthalo blue and the opaque black. And this is going to be really dark. So what I'm going to do real quick. And again, it's, you, you guys can't see this, but I'm just kind of folding up a paper towel just to kind of keep it off the edge so that I, as I put my hand on this, I'm not resting my hand on the painting, uh, just to keep the oils and, and things off. So with this darker color now, what I want to do is I want to start throwing in, if this didn't dry already, which it did, <laughs> dries really fast. Um, with this dark slate blue, it's just a phthalo blue with, with, with black mixed into it. This is what I'll use to kind of start cutting in the really tiny details. This might be reduced too much, but um, you can always kind of tell as you're kind of working with it, uh, with the paintbrush, how reduced you actually need it. Um, if it flows off the brush too quickly, it can make a mess. Um, if, it's, if it's not wet enough, it, it'll just get stuck on the brush and it won't come off at all. So a lot of it is just kind of back and forth, repalletting the brush to try to get just the right flow off the brush. And that's, I wish there was a, there was a, um, a formula that I could say add exactly this amount of reducer to the paint, but it really isn't like that. Um, it's really kind of a, you know, you just kind of feel it as you go along. The reason why is not only because it's a, it's a very like subtle type of feel as you're adding reducer and kind of getting it to flow the way you want it to, but again, the stuff starts drying as soon as you put it out. So you may have the perfect formula and it may work exactly the way you want it, but on a day when the temperature is a little bit different or you have different humidity, that perfect formula is now going to be different. It's not going to work the way that it originally worked. So you really got to kind of work on the fly. And that's where knowing the rules, again, really helps you break them. So it allows you to know kind of what's going on with the paint so that you can make the adjustments that you need. I'm also taking this black now and I'm kind of moving into the trees a little bit as well to kind of add the darkest areas in this. Using the same color across different areas will also help to kind of tie the whole image together and makes it look looks less like a like a jigsaw puzzle. It just kind of locks the pieces together. All right, so we get a little bit more of this. And I'm starting to work on the outside edge of this where all those really tight details are as this reflects all the areas of the motor around it. So I'll just kind of throw those lines in as well. And it's so funny, going back to kind of what I was just talking about, you will, you'll find the brush will be palleted just perfectly, like the paint is coming off exactly the way you want it. 
and then it'll dry a little bit and it won't work anymore. So it's a constant back and forth. But it, it also is kind of the, the fun part about doing this. You know, you really, you really get into that, I call it like a tractor pull, wrestling match with the paint. And it's not that the paint isn't performing well, it's actually just that it's doing exactly what it's supposed to. Paint is supposed to dry, you know, it's supposed to produce this, this, this bulletproof film when you're done. So you can't have both. You can't have it flow really nicely and be open forever. And then, you, so you really have to kind of bounce back and forth, which makes it a lot of fun. With this dark color, I can really start to kind of define those deepest details in the reflections, like as this is actually my shirt right here. So um, I can kind of start pulling those details out and also my shoe, which is down here. It's funny, again, you kind of start looking at all these details, these chrome reflections, and you end up starting to try to figure out, you know, what the heck you're looking at. And it is a catch-22. Sometimes you just got to kind of just paint what you see and ignore what it is. So all these little details in here. And this is all the same slate blue. Um, what's nice, too, here is because this blue is such a universal color across this whole painting, um, I can use it everywhere. And I can always bump it around and shift it later on with other colors or tinting or whatever. But for this, it works really well. So in the shadows, all these shadows on the ground, this is a shadow of, again, of, of me standing there taking this photo. Uh, all the shadows are really cool. They're blue, kind of a cool bluish shadow. So I can use this paint color in just about everything. Just kind of lock all this in. Now I've got pretty much all the details done on the asphalt part of it. So I can actually go in now and start with like the shadow. I don't have to just block it in. I can really kind of start putting in some really, really kind of the final tighter details with this. Now I blocked this in originally with the airbrush. So uh, now I can really kind of start using the paintbrush to really define some of those shapes. What's nice is because I have the, air or the airbrush blocking in part of it already done, all I'm doing is really kind of cleaning up the outside edges and adding a little bit of kind of texture to that too. I'm not just painting over the whole thing and filling it in. I'm kind of just painting the edges and leaving that softer airbrush transparency on the outside edge or on the inside, sorry. The outside edge is what's really sharp. And again, you can see how long this paint is lasting in this brush. Again, if you look at what acrylic paints do in a paintbrush, they, they really dry, especially if you over-reduce them because they, they have more reducer in them, so they tend to dry faster. But adding a little bit of that 40-50, kind of palleting, palleting it in with the, with the paint really does a great job of keeping it open a little bit longer. And again, the bonus is, in the end, normally this area would be very fragile because it has a whole lot of reducer and a whole, like not a whole lot of paint. But because I've reintroduced that 4050 into it, it really does hold together very nicely and it forms a very, very strong film, which is great. Not that I'm going to be masking on any of this, but if I had to, uh, you have a much better chance of having uh, that paint stay where it's supposed to when you have that 4050 in the mix. Okay. So again, just kind of locking in as I'm. As this paint is drying in the brush, I'm getting as much as I can out of this before I have to repallet it. That's looking pretty good. I'm not worried about um, areas if they look too much, like they have too much brush stroke in them. The airbrush will take care of that in the end. So I'm just kind of getting everything I can out of this one color. That's looking pretty good. In this section here. Now, at this point, the, the paint is pretty much dried out, so I am going to have to repallet this real quick. Uh, the paint stays, again, as long as I keep it grouped like together on the palette in a droplet, it'll stay open. It'll stay wet on the palette for quite a while as well. But again, it does dry on the palette too, so again, I try to just keep it to a few drops on the palette as well. So, all right, so a couple of dark areas. The highlights are always last, even after the airbrush parts. So there's a lot of highlights in the chrome, like really bright, shiny highlights. Those are the last kind of thing that's done on this. 
Um, so I, for now, I just kind of avoid all of them. Just let them kind of be until, until I get to them. Uh, and again, they, they sit on the, the chrome as the, kind of the last piece. So there we go. Paint loves to stick to itself as well, so that's another good bonus of, or you know, something that really helps out with this weaker, you know, over-reduced paint. Um, it's sticking to itself. So if it was sticking to a non-paint-like surface, you'd have you, you'd have more adhesion problems. But because I'm actually just kind of working over paint that's already there, again, I'm not worried at all about how this paint is sticking. Again. You know, I really, uh, I don't, I wouldn't want to mask on this. And if I did have to mask on this, like for since it's like in the 103, if I really wanted to mask that off, um, you know, you, you you can certainly do it. But again, you just have to be really careful of of how aggressive that masking is. The FBS gold mask is usually my go-to mask uh, or tape for things like that because it has just enough adhesion to kind of mask off the area, but not so much that it'll really start to pull paint up, even when it's kind of compromised like this. So we'll get the rest of these darker details in. There aren't too, too many of them. This section up here is almost all gray. It's actually more bluish, but what, what's going on on the top of this air cleaner is the reflection of the tank above. So it's got a lot of blue in it, but it's also very dark because the reflection on the top of this air cleaner is actually the shaded side of the tank. This section right here, which is kind of the, the rubber gasket on the front of the air cleaner, instead of hitting that with the air uh, paintbrush, I'll do that first with the airbrush to, because that transition right there is really smooth. It's really, really uh, just an even transition from dark to light. If I do that with the paintbrush, um, I'll get really kind of a streaky transition, and I don't really want that. So, um, so I'll do that with the airbrush once I get into it. Try to group the the jobs as we go. You know, the airbrush kind of set up the airbrush and then do all the airbrush sections and the paintbrush, same thing. You know, just kind of do all the paintbrush sections. The details in this screw too that hold the air cleaner on are kind of cool. They're in here as well. But that's all coming together pretty sharp. There's a really bright highlight along here too. What I'm thinking. There's a lot going on in this black, this is a black plastic, or I think it's plastic, black plastic panel where the 103 is on. But it's got some, it's shiny and it's got some reflections in it as well. So I think that might be a good, uh, we might have to do that with the airbrush first and then put the 103 in last. The 103, the, it says 103 and it says uh, high output. Um, that'll actually, I'll do that 103 when I do the highlights because that'll be almost bright white. It's kind of a really pale blue, but Still, I can get away with that when I do the highlights, so I'm not overly worried about that. All right. So that's looking good. Let's see, do I wanna do that? I think I do. So I gotta put in my, the skin tone here, um, which is what it is, it's my arm and my hand where it's holding the camera. Uh, and it's funny that you have all this chrome, but yet you have skin tone. If um, and it pops in and out all, in all, all different places, which is kind of funny uh, that you have, you know, skin tone that someone may not even notice. But that's the beauty of this stuff. I love doing this with paintings where there's things in there that you don't immediately see, but um, but as you look at it more and more, um, you really start to uh, pick up different things. And that's half the fun of this. You know, you get these little kind of Easter eggs that go on in the painting, and every painting has it. Uh, this one, for instance, the uh, VIN number on this bike is actually all my kids' birthdays. So I just kind of lined them all up and changed the VIN number to my kids' birthdays. So you, you guys know that now, but that's just one of those fun little Easter eggs. All right. For the base color for the skin tone, this is actually really easy. And I didn't show you this because the palette's way over there now. But the skin tone that I use almost always is a little bit of red and a little bit of red oxide, which is my 
go to orange. I know that sounds weird, but OO12 is the wicked red oxide. And it's one of those colors that I use all the time. It's, it's right up there with, with uh, yellow ochre and phthalo blue. I love red oxide as an orange. It's just really versatile. Um, it creates this great skin tone, and I'll show it to you here as I kind of block this area in. Uh, and all this is is a little bit of white and a little bit of red oxide. If I want to warm that up, um, which I will when I kind of put in the, the details with the airbrush, um, I'll use a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of red, a little bit of black. But as far as a basic skin tone, um, it works really, really well. Uh, this whole area here of my hand is, uh, this is my hand right here holding the camera. Um, it's actually in the shadow anyway. So all I need is just a, like I said, a base skin tone that'll kind of block that in. Just like I did the sky and the ground. I'll let that dry and then I'll work in some of the details on that. Right up here in the corner, there's, you can actually see my elbow popping up. This is a bit of artistic license. Um, I could put that piece in, but I think I'm going to leave it out. I think it's, 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 it's there, I know what it is, but if I put it there, it just kind of becomes a distraction um, because the main highlights in this air cleaner are here and here. And um, if you have those two bright highlights, which are really the ones, some of the brightest highlights in this painting, if you have that balanced, again, this weird elbow sticking out, <laughs> it doesn't really work as well. So we're gonna leave that out. All right. And again, there's usually a lot of that going on of you know, that whole artistic license thing where you just kind of leave out the things that don't really make sense. Um, and just keep on um, keep the things that do or make for a stronger image really that's what you're looking for you know it's not so much that photorealistic image where you really want to capture exactly what the camera caught which is completely valid and a great way to paint this is more just um, just kind of being able to push different images and what I call it is human Photoshop you know you take that image and you do things to it so that it really you know, really becomes the image you want. So what I've done is I've gone back in since I've realized that there's more trees in here, which happens as you look at things closer and closer. You realize that there's more going on there. So there are trees that are kind of in this reflection along the edge too. So I'll throw those in too. And this is just that same really light green that I used originally. And I use light green because in this instance, instead of the dark green, because it seems like the lightest parts of the trees are really what's being reflected here. There's not a whole bunch of dark area in there. So I will darken that a little bit to add those dark areas on that, that highlight. This paint is still wet, so this will actually work out really well because that dark paint I'm putting on now is gonna kinda mix in and blend with that lighter paint and I'll be able to blend it right on the surface. You can't always get away with that. You know, the, the, the paint dries so fast, you can't really work wet on wet all the time, but sometimes you can, which is nice. All right, so there's the green for that. Since I have this green in here, I just wanna make sure I've got that green everywhere, which I'll put it up here as well. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, okay, good. So there's one more section that I gotta kinda pay attention to. There, right before you get to this black panel here, this, this folds over. This, it's like an indented section where this green pan, or a black panel is. So there's a really bright sky blue highlight on both sides of this. So I'm gonna get that in. And again, this is that same, this is why it's nice to kind of work with the same colors over and over again. You really don't have to guess. You know, you know what you did to get there. Uh, so this is gonna be that same phthalo blue and a little bit of white. And I'll add a little bit of 4050 to it on the palette and a little bit of reducer. Now normally what I'd do is I would turn the panel, but in order to keep things sane as far as the camera goes, I'm just gonna go for it here. So your hand, just like in airbrushing, it works the same way with paint brushing. Your hand has a certain range of motion. Your hand likes to work in certain ways and it doesn't like to work in other ways. So this is why it's nice working on these small panels because I can twist and turn them any way I want so that it's, my hand's always comfortable. Uh, so it's always a good idea, especially when you're dealing with these like real fine, tight details. The tendency is you want to kind of just get them done and you don't take the time to you know, kind of move the panel around to get it where you need it. 
like I'm doing now, but you get the idea. This paint is reduced a little bit more than normal. And the reason for that is because I'm pulling these long lines and I want to make sure that the paint keeps coming off the brush. If it's really thick, it's not going to want to flow off the brush like this. So the downside is, is I have to make several passes on that line to get it to the opacity that I want. But the upside is I get, I get to pull these long lines with this paint instead of having it dry out immediately. I don't have to be perfect on it. I just have to, again, get, kind of get it in where it should be because I'll be cleaning it up after with a little bit of highlights and shadows and stuff. Same thing with this blue. I have it mixed up, so I'm going to run around the, the, the image and kind of put this in where it should be. This blue, again, this is the sky reflecting, so it appears in a number of different spots. So I'm just going to run around the painting a little bit and get this in as it goes. Um, what you find is, as a, the farther I go along, the more refined things get, and the more you end up seeing, too. So as you're working on these things, you start seeing all kinds of other things. So this, uh, this sky color repeat, just repeats throughout this whole thing. And it's the sky, but it's actually the sky being reflected in other parts of the motor. So it's not really the sky that you're seeing, it's the sky being reflected through everything. And that's why it kind of pops up everywhere, especially on a bike like this where so much of it is chrome. But that, again, that's why we picked this image because it just, it really like has a ton of chrome on it. So it makes for a good image. All right, that is looking good. This area up here, is it mostly, believe it or not, this area, the little detail up here is mostly airbrushing. And same thing with the blending of like where my pant leg is. That's all airbrushing too, but we are getting really close to the point where we'll actually switch over to the airbrush. We'll switch over to the airbrush, start blending all this, and then, um, and then from there we'll jump back to the paintbrush to do things like the 103 and to set up the highlights too. So let me do one last thing here. I'm going to kind of base out the skin tone a little bit darker. The skin tone, again, that's going to be a lot, of, a lot of airbrushing as well to kind of blend that together. But to start, I want to get, again, I want to get that kind of blocked in so I don't have to do everything with the airbrush. The trick is, again, you, you rely on the strengths of each tool. A, a good airbrush can get really, really fine detail, but not as fine as a paintbrush on a consistent basis. Um, and a paintbrush can get some really nice blends and, and fades, but not as nice as an airbrush. So you end up bouncing back and forth and stealing the strengths of both until you get this image that is exactly the way you want it. So I think that's going to be good. That's the same skin tone that I used. I just add a little bit of black and a little bit more red oxide to it to kind of get it darker. That, that hand and the arm there will be much darker when it's done, but that just sets me up so I don't have to build up all that color with the airbrush. All right, and I think I'm going to, since I'm here and I said I was going to do this rubber gasket with the airbrush, I think I'm going to do I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to base it in with the, um, with the, with the paintbrush first, and then I'll, I'll just adjust it with the, with the airbrush after. So I'm mixing up a gray using just opaque white and opaque black, and what I do is I pick the lightest part of that, the gray color, and that's the color I'm going to kind of block it all in with. So one of the advantages, again, of doing this with the paintbrush and block it in with the paintbrush is I don't have to mask this off at all. I can just use the paintbrush and the sharp edges that the paintbrush produces to produce that sharp edge. I will literally be able to go in here with the airbrush and nothing else and just shade that now. I'll be ready to go. All right, let me go get the airbrush set up and um, we'll switch out and we'll get this locked in.